Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Customers Bank, Ariel Property Advisors, Capital One Bank, Sterling National Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, B6 Real Estate Advisors, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, RPW Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringor Family Foundation, and these friends. Architect, developer, Brooklyn, New York, candy stores, Rambam Yeshiva, Yeshiva University, Dartmouth, St. Anne's School, another public school up in Harlem, Yale, developer, Shea Stadium, Williamsburg, Shearing Plow. I have the developer, oh, and I failed to say the founding director of the Newman Institute. Henry Woolman, thank you for being here today. Pleasure to be here with you. So tell me about your father's side first, and then your mother's side. My parents were both born around 1900, 1903, My mother's family was in the scrap metal business in Philadelphia. And uh, how they met is a mystery to me, but they met somehow, and they got married in about 1930. Yeah, and we have a beautiful picture of your mother and your father, those photos that were done over there with uh, his tuxedo and your mother wearing that beautiful dress. It was something. It was something. So tell me about Dad, the Pitt Street boy. So the Pitt Street boy was someone, he died when I was six. So I didn't really know him well, except he put me into the yeshiva because, perhaps not because of his great religiosity, but because he was afraid of Brooklyn public schools at that moment. Hard to know exactly. You lived in the Kings Highway section of Brooklyn, We right? lived on Ocean Parkway, yes, in the, right. in, in the Midwood section, in Kings Midwood. Highway, yes, exactly. But you told me when we got together that your father worked in a place like Times Square stores, an auto place, and then he had his own, and he, which gave you impetus in your life later on of developing. He showed you a map, right? I think that if you want my psychology of that, Michael, it is that uh, I was very impressed by his, by the map of the future stores that he wanted to open in the auto accessories business. And that level of entrepreneurship stuck with me as a way of me redeeming his life, perhaps, if one wants a crazy psychological explanation. But I come back to it because it certainly was something that has hovered in the back of my mind for many of the years since. Now, you were born in Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn. Your mother and father sent you to this yeshiva Rambam. Right. Okay? And then when your father died unexpectedly of a heart attack, you know, there was some insurance, but there wasn't really enough money, and your mother was very sick, as you were saying. Yes. You know, you took care of your mother for many years. And she had had two children who had died before me, one at birth and one when she was three. So there was a sense of tragedy and, and loss that consistently hovered over her spirit. So at the age of eight, 
What happens? The, the candy store of putting the newspapers together? So by the age of eight, the, I had no spending money and, and no money to go to school with, really. And I said, I have to do something about this. It took me maybe two years to come out of the funk of his death, both at school and at home, when I said, you have to rescue your own life. And I could not have been more than eight. I remember the school moment exactly, and the non-school moments were probably coincident with that. And I walked around trying to figure out where could I get a job. And somehow, I, there was a candy store a block away from the house in what were, we called those in those days uh, a thousand years ago, candy stores. And, but they sold everything. You had a counter with egg creams and all of that stuff. But they also sold the, the newspapers every day. But on the weekend, the Sunday papers in those years were a big deal. There were seven newspapers left in and New you York had to City. Put, put the and you had to put the, all the sections together because advertising was the lifeblood in those pre-TV days of how, the, so the papers were very large and many pages and many sections. And I, on Saturday, you put the first half together. On Sunday morning, you put the second half together. And you had stacks of these seven newspapers outside of the store, inside the store. So it was a big deal to find someone who could put those things together. That was my very first job. So when do you graduate Rambam? So I graduated uh, in the eighth grade. And uh, um, then the question is where to go to high school. And I decided that the Yeshiva University High School, which there was a Brooklyn branch and a Manhattan branch, said if you would, because I was a very good Talmudist, if you can believe it, given my present life, uh, I was a good Talmudist in those, in those days. And I uh, said, okay, the best Talmud academy was the Yeshiva University High School, Manhattan branch, where it had famous people like Alan Dershowitz and the rest who went to that. There was a Brooklyn branch, and I went to the Brooklyn branch for the next four years until now, I graduated so, high school. But you also elevated your job. Yes. As opposed to the candy store with the newspapers, you were able to become the usher in the movie theater. Yes, right? it was on Avenue P and Ocean and East 3rd Street. There was a movie theater. They paid a little more. And I was able to work uh, in the evenings and on the weekends during the course of the day. So I did that until I was 16 when I was able to take, in those days, the post office exam and worked in the post office for my last two years of high school on the night shift, which was 6 p.m. to 2.30 a.m. So how did the yeshiva boy decide to go to Dartmouth? I guess I... It's a very hard question to answer exactly, but my level of reading was wide in those days, and I was enamored of the history of 17th century New England and the creation of the founding colonies in the United States and the English 17th century philosophers, the creation of government theory, the creation of the idea of, the, uh, of democracy in the town commons. All of that said to me, there is another world out there that maybe is not better than the yeshiva world, maybe not worse, but of great interest to me. And I, I would say that those two avenues, one the yeshiva avenue and the Jewish world avenue, and the other the Anglo-Saxon high culture American wasp, the other avenue have been the pattern so when, of my so life. So when did you uh, enter Dartmouth? So I entered Dartmouth in 1962. I was 17 years old then, and I majored in philosophy, and uh, Dartmouth was very good to me because I was also a good artist, a good graphic designer, right. you know, and they gave me a job uh, to work my way through. There were no scholarships because I was afraid if I applied for a scholarship, they wouldn't take me in. There was no doubt a Jewish issue in many of the Ivy League schools in those, in those days. So it's interesting to read the stories of how people get into the thing in, in our current press environment. And there were two places that interested me, Amherst and Dartmouth, both New England, both small, both embedded in the history of New England uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon. But, but Dartmouth, you were able to have a job. But I had a job. It was twice as big as Amherst, and they offered me a job as well. So, and I was the graphic designer, one of the graphic designers in the art center, which had just opened at Dartmouth, the Hopkins Center, worked there, went to school there, and had my first two years, was a philosophy major, and worked there for two years, and then worked during the summers, both of the post office at night, but in the second summer, I got a job with- St. Uh, Anne's. At, with the Episcopal Diocese of New York, which ran, 
impoverished neighborhood after school programs and summer programs at the St. Anne's Church on, uh, in the Bronx, in the South Bronx. And it was a, a sort of a, a partially school, partially this, a, a summer activity program for the kids in that in that Yeah, but world. you stayed on that for another but year. But then after, my, after the summer, I said, I don't want to go back to Dartmouth. You wanted to make some money. I wanted to make some money, but I also wanted to do something that was meaningful to me within that class structure, within that segment of deep poverty, which despite my own background, I had never really experienced because my mother was protective as much as she could, and I was also prepared to work hard on my own. So this level of deep inner city poverty was a new experience for me, and I always believed that education was the way out for these kids, so we created an after-school educational program with the help of NYU and CUNY and some other, and Columbia, to do tutor training with the kids of this neighborhood after school for that next year. So then you spent that for a year, and then you went back to Dartmouth. And then Dartmouth. I went back to Dartmouth in my third year and the fourth year, and finished Dartmouth, and then went on to Yale Architecture. And So how did you decide to all of a sudden go with Yale Architecture? Well, I was a very good graphic designer, but my love was not graphic design, because how could a Jewish boy love graphic design? It had to have some impact upon the culture. Architecture was the avenue for thinking about that. And Yale was, of course, the, in my years, the great art architecture school in the country. The real lure was that everyone said to me, you'll never get into Yale. And so when I, it was a small program. When I did, the ego issues caught up with me, and I said, I am going. Now, what do you do about working when you were at Yale? I worked uh, at the, initially at the library, at the Yale library, the big Yale library, Sterling Library, every evening from 6 to midnight. And then I was asked, because of time that I had done at the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU, the great art history school in the country. When did you do the fine arts program? From 1968 through 1970. And I was, I was lucky enough to be able to teach the fifth grade in Harlem as alternate service for those years. And in the day, I would be at 165 teaching the fifth grade in Harlem, which I loved. And then I would get on the bus and go to the Institute of Fine Arts at 78th and 5th Avenue, which was the other reach of high Western and Wasp culture. Right, and culture. Then, then the world changed, and you were able to, we had the lottery, and you had a high number. That's so, right, yes. So, so you were I was able, able to go, to go back, back to, 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 Yale. to Yale to finish in September of 1970. And you graduated number one in your class. I did, I did, with the AIA medal, that's which was the distinguishing characteristic. So what happens that. now? So you have, a, you have a Dartmouth and a Yale program, and the Army is looking to catch you again. So I was, I was Jake lucky Javits, right? that, that before the draft uh, uh, lottery gave me a high number, which allowed me to go back to Yale, uh, Jake Javits's office, he was then senator, and his office took me under their wings, partially because of the year that I'd spent in the South Bronx, and they, they called Selective Service, and I met with the associate head of the Selective Service in the city, and he said, okay, we're gonna let you go back and, and finish. Okay, so you graduate from Yale, and what do you do now? That was the question, what do I do? In those days, a very talented designer, IMPA's office interested me greatly, it seemed to me like he was working on the, uh, the National Gallery issues, working on the Kennedy Library. And the person that I, one of the people I admired the most, because he was of a very staunch New England patrician background, a man named Henry Cobb, was one of Pay's partners. So I applied there, and they said, well, we don't have a job for you right now, but we're going to keep you. James Sterling, a very renowned 20th century architect, had been my mentor, and I had done a great thesis project with Sterling. So those drawings were sent to Cobb, who liked them, and uh, four months, so I went to work on an intermediate project in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then in October, Pay's office called and said, we have the job, we'd like you to come if you still want to work for us. So I was on the next, I don't know, the next uh, trolley car out of Philadelphia. Right, so you stayed at pay, uh, pay for a couple of years, right? I stayed at pay for a couple of years until a man named John Zuccotti and uh, uh, Alex Garvin offered me uh, 
a role in what was then the transformatory moment of the community development block grant programs for New York City in terms of creating a new housing policy. And housing had always been my sort of great passion, the issues of what social architecture, whatever that phrase may mean, to me ultimately revolved around two issues, housing and the quality of the urban neighborhood environment in which the school was set. And so here was a chance to go into uh, the core as a consultant, now, not as a member of the administration, but as a consultant to Garvin uh, on the Neighborhood Preservation Program to meet John Zuccotti. Barry Light was the head of housing at city planning at that point, working on core city, future city planning issues. And I did that for about 18 months. What happens next? And then I didn't know. The, that gig came to an end. I had a choice of going back to pay, which I said, I don't really want to do because I'll be put into another very fancy high-end right. project. And uh, so I said, I don't know exactly what I want to do, but I'm going to start a small planning firm of my own, which, which I did call the Commons Planning Corporation. Uh, essentially, we worked on Harlem issues with Max Bond, uh, who, who was a, a, a renowned black architect and a wonderful man in the city. And we worked with help from the Ford Foundation and the Butenweiser Foundation on creating a very socially conscious planning firm of the city. Eventually, I needed to make a real living. And a man named Lou Davis, a Davis Brody, offered me a job. And I went back into normative architecture with Davis Brody for the next three years. And then one more year at a firm called HLW, where I was the, uh, worked with a man named Stuart Pertz as the associate director of design. And then I said, I've had enough working for other people. I need to do, to go back to that entrepreneurial spirit of working on my own, which in 1982, I then did. My heart was always in the housing issues, and one of the reasons one went to Davis Brody is because he was the most innovative housing architect in the city. Great projects that he and Richard Ravitch put together, and Ravitch was an icon in, 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 in many ways and was about to run for mayor, if, if one remembers some of those things. So from 82, we did uh, the master plan for the rebuilding of Shea Stadium with a man named Jack Gordon and the, new, the master plan for the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Right, with her partisans. And, and, and part, Columbia, exactly, partisans just coming right, into the city then. At the city, at yes, Columbia University. At Columbia University. It just started coming in from NIMH. But again, all of this was wonderful and interesting, but not housing. And at that point, I said, I'm only going to try in my planning architectural firm to do housing projects. I was offered a couple, but I was fortunate enough in some ways to, be, to become associated with a man named Hyman Krauss with a company called Krauss Development, which nobody remembers anymore. But Krauss, in effect, was a very advanced thinker in terms of low-income housing for his day. And uh, we wound up doing three projects together. Uh, a master plan with Jim Polshek, the architect for Arvern, right. for the full Arvern project. Right, the and redevelopment. The, the redevelopment of that 300-acre stretch on right. the Atlantic Ocean. And then we did a building together in uh, Forest Hills, a 21-story building right. in Forest Hills, which is still there. And then another housing project in Great Neck, and I got to know Great Neck that way. And we did some other work in Great Neck. And then I said, enough of this sort of halfway world of being half with the development world, half in the then architectural you went, then world. Then you became a developer. Then I became a developer. And right. I made and the decision. And that's when you went up to Westchester. And that's when I went up to Westchester, yes. Right, because there was the Yonkers program. That's right. I was asked to direct the second half of the Yonkers housing case, which was a, a, a big privilege at that point. Uh, and uh, it was the very famous housing case with Leonard Sand as the district judge who, who ran it, with HUD, with NAACP. I did that, but then I opened my own development office in Westchester, in Mount Kisco, where I thought a relatively, you know, unwealthy architect would be able to figure out how to finance some of the developments that I was interested in doing on land prices, which were not New York City land prices. We opened the office in Mount Kisco, uh, an office in New York City as well, and we began to do uh, what was the beginning of my mixed income vision of how to build moderate income housing. So what happens in 1996? 
Get a phone call from phone call from Baruch. Baruch. He wasn't. He, he wasn't was the head quite. Of Baruch he was the head of Baruch, and saying, "Well, we have. Uh, there's a man named William Newman who's about to give a major gift, in terms of the creation of a real estate institute at the City University. We'd like you to consider being founding director of that. Uh, the governor has seen the work you did in Westchester and things like that, and we're very interested. Not in you. We're interested in cultivating Bill Newman." because Bill Newman, who was the head of New Plan Realty Trust at that point, uh, clearly a brilliant businessman and an aggressive businessman. And but a also Baruch graduate. And a Baruch graduate and a very decent human being. So you become the founding director the, of the, of the Newman, Newman Real Estate in, in the city. But you're also allowed to do development I'm, and planning. That's right. I'm allowed to continue as long as it is an ancillary, quote unquote, to what we're doing in a 40 or 45 hour a week role at the Institute to continue to work on the development projects, and especially given the fact that we were into the creation of, a, of an approach to mixed income housing, which we eventually took to Bedford uh, after Mount Kisco and after Chappaqua to create what was then the first mixed income, non-subsidized, privately funded it was a 76-unit project in, in Bedford uh, and uh, built, and it was where 20% of the units were devoted to local school teachers, civic uh, town employees of Bedford, uh, aged citizens of Bedford who could no longer afford the taxes in there. We wrote a new zoning code for the town of Bedford to allow the additional density to happen. And I was on my way in terms of the real focus of how do you build large scale, even though that was only a 76 unit project, but my vision was we needed a solution which was to be a private sector solution, not a government run solution subject to the vagaries of public funding to create mixed income workforce housing alongside market housing together uh, without segregating them in separate buildings. You leave the Newman Institute in 2006. You do a number of major innovative plans, including the Hudson Yards and certain other programs at the Newman Institute. You then go full-time into back into development. That's right. I just add one more thing, Michael. We had done for Betsy Gottbaum and for the City Council as my parting sort of I don't know what to call it, a gift perhaps, to, the, to uh, the Institute, a very large study on the future options for affordable housing within New York City. And that was a the five volume The precursor to thing. the 70 And it's program. the precursor. We wrote in volume three of that the first real statement of two issues, one, the 7030 program, and the second, what to do with housing authority sites. Let's talk briefly about the project that you did on Bedford Avenue in Williamsburg. Uh, in uh, the the first chance after I left in tw 2006, the the institute was we bought with some with a group of partners um, uh, a Russian Swiss hedge fund essentially uh, a, a very large site in Williamsburg on North Third Street between Bedford and Berry. We did a variety of plans uh, for uh, the the Bloomberg administration, all of which he was interested in which would create a, the first 70-30 proposal. Right, Could 70 market, 30% affordable. affordable. Well, right. we didn't use the word affordable because it wasn't really intended to reach the lowest income levels, which I don't know what the solution for the lowest right, income but levels with, is. But this was, you know, lower income, lower middle class. Right, so what happened was the project included retail. Included retail. The largest, uh, Dwayne Reed, a 45,000 Yes, square all below market. grade. Uh, all retail, below grade. So that we also didn't lose some townhouses. Above grade. Townhouse in the middle. It's a full block right. project. And on then North also Third. some residential apartments. That's right. Okay. Currently, you're involved with this major project up in Washington Heights, as we would say. Yes, which I, I can't talk about too much yet, but it is, we did a very large project in Astoria, which which would have produced 3,000 units of, of total housing, a third, 30 percent of which would have been workforce housing. And now we're into what may very well be the final large-scale project. That, up in the Heights. Uh, up in the Heights. Okay, so let's also talk about family. Quickly, tell me how you met Barbara. I met Barbara, who is Your the most... Wife, yes, Barbara Taylor. A, Barbara Taylor, who's the most amazing woman in the history of the world. Well, maybe second only to your wife. And um, we met on the M4 bus as she was going home one evening, and I was going home from uh, dinner with my eldest daughter in New York. 
and uh, somehow in the space of 57th Street to 79th Street. Right, so you found your love on the M4 yes, bus. Yes, absolutely. And then yes. you, didn't, you knew her name. But didn't know anything but, else about and, and her and except her did, name. And then you did research. Because she, I also knew about her Smith College connection. Okay. So good. using those two things so that she got off the bus at 79th and Madison, knew, knowing her name and the Smith College connection, I so let's talk became about your, a detective. Your, let's talk about your daughters and their your grandchildren. So I have two daughters, one of whom is a full-time investment banker in London, has lived in London since she graduated from Dartmouth, working initially for Goldman Sachs and then Fortress and then right. those she kinds of two, people. Uh, and she has two sweet young boys and a third on the way. Yeah. And then my other daughter is uh, uh, Kate, and she works for uh, Hunter Roberts. In a as a very dedicated builder. So she, she's a developer. No, she, she works, works as a builder. Uh, and she builder. loves the building side of it right. and has an architecture degree from Princeton, having gone to Dartmouth as well. So I fostered whatever the connections are, this family. So the nice thing is you've been an educator, you've been a developer, you've been a great community leader, and it's nice to see the kid from Brooklyn succeed, and I'm happy I that I've had you here today. Thanks for being here. You're very kind. Thank you.